This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Juan Carlos Serpa. A new era in electrophysiology is finally arriving. Some pulse field ablation catheters are finally approved by FDA in the United States. And we have seen so many first users in the US as well. For our tour in Latin America, we are all waiting to get it, but with great powers comes great responsibilities. Today, I'm joined by Professor Prash Sanders, well-known electrophysiologist and scientist from Adelaide University in Australia. Dr. Prash, welcome to Heart Freedom TV. And thank you, Juan, for having me. It's such a pleasure to have you on board. We are living the pulse field ablation race, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I want to know, how were the beginnings of the PFA in Australia? Tell us a little about your first impressions and how this has changed your clinical practice. Yeah, so I mean, we our experiences, uh, initial experience with with the Farapulse system, and uh, this was commercially released in Australia, a little bit ahead of where it's been released in the United States, um, and it was a wow experience, you know, uh, to see signals that we'd worked hard at to ablate over time just instantly disappear was just a tremendous experience uh, to, to, uh, to witness. Um, and really we've shifted our workflow very quickly to be incorporating uh, pulse field ablation in, in almost all cases and definitely uh, most of the de novo cases. The, uh, the workflow itself in the, in the lab happened very quickly especially if uh, labs are used to one-shot technologies, it becomes really easy because uh, you are used to a, a large uh, sheath being introduced. You're used to accessing the pulmonary veins uh, with a single uh, catheter. Uh, and, and so it was quite easy to incorporate. I think what was slightly difficult to incorporate is our dependence on 3D mapping. Because uh, definitely with the Farapal system in the current form, you're more reliant on using uh, X-ray. And perhaps if you use intracardiac echo, you might be able to get away with it. Uh, but we don't use intracardiac echo in Australia. And so we, we increased our, uh, our X-ray time significantly as a result of the move. But the, the results have been kind of uh, enormous. Uh, the case time is it's, it's quicker. Um, the ease of the procedure got quicker and the reproducibility between operators got better. And I think that's probably the biggest point that uh, is going to change our field uh, with PFA. Great. So PFA is becoming a normal, right? It's a normal practice. I, I think given we have a commercially available system uh, that is quickly uh, pivoting, to becoming normal. So sites that have PFA uh, are now uh, almost exclusively using PFA for the de novo uh, AF ablation cases. There are definitely sites that haven't taken it on yet. And uh, I guess that it also depends on your workload because yeah. traditionally these systems are made simply for the pulmonary veins itself. And it's a question of how you can use it outside of that and whether your laboratory is comfortable using it outside of that. For pulmonary vein isolation alone in experienced hands, it's probably about the same time frame uh, to kind of do the procedure. So it's, it's really not a huge saving in terms of uh, procedural time, but there's definite other savings that you get in terms of the ease of the procedure, the, the stress levels, you know, are we going to be at risk of a fistula is always something that we're, kind of concerned about, and whereas we don't really have to have that concern uh, quite to the same degree with PFA. Um, but as, as we will discuss, uh, you know, there are new problems that are emerging that we kind of need to be uh, to bear in mind. Um, yeah. We've been so fortunate that we have some kind of first-in-man studies. So we've had the opportunity to, you know, try Pulse Select. We've uh, uh, also tried the Vault system. We've, uh, we're also now involved in a circular uh, catheter uh, uh, PFA to try and uh, see where there may be nuances between systems. Uh, and, and I think this is going to be an interesting arena for our field uh, in, the, in the next few years. And we all want to learn about it. 
We feel so much so comfortable with the safety profile that PFA offers, sparing software goods, phrenic nerves, and but sometimes we may see some high vagal responses and maybe some artery spasms and hemolysis too. What do you think we should do to adapt this to our common workflow? Yeah. So I I mean the the um the phrenic nerve stimulation is is I think something that we it, it seems to be technology uh, dependent. Uh, so if you have a very big antenna, uh, it seems to be more likely that you're going to capture the phrenic nerve. And uh, thankfully, most of the injuries that have been seen have been transient injuries as opposed to permanent injuries like what we've seen with thermal uh, energy. Um, so it, it is still safe, but uh, I, I think depending on whether it's unipolar, whether it's bipolar, uh, the configuration of the catheter, I think we're going to see different experiences. And similarly, in terms of, uh, of skeletal muscle rec recruitment during the procedure, I think we're going to find that some of the technologies recruit skeletal muscle a lot less, and so going to be more suitable uh, for uh, uh, procedures in the awake patient, uh, you know, under, under sedation, as opposed to needing general anesthetic for the whole thing. So there'll be some differences there. The curry spasm is, is a real thing. And I guess in the setting of pulmonary vein or posterior wall, we have very little curry arteries in that location. And that's where we're majority using. But as we get closer to the, uh, to the uh, isthmuses, um, I think we're going to face curry spasm. Now, whether this is Technology dependent in terms of uh, you know the pulse width of the impulse, whether it's the size of the catheter, I, these are yet to be determined. I don't think our incidence is absolutely proven. I mean, thankfully, uh, you know, people ahead of us, Vivek Reddy has already done the study looking at GTN uh, to kind of prevent this, and so you know we have some options uh, available. The hemolysis story is going to be interesting, you know, because whenever you deliver energy, uh, there is going to be a degree of hemolysis. So I, I think you're going to see this with almost all of the systems. Clearly, it wasn't recognized early on when it was selected groups that were doing it because people didn't look for it. Um, and now we're all uh, acutely aware of it and we're looking for it. I mean, we are seeing a degree of hemolysis, the question is when it becomes significant and when you lead to the next phase of kind of renal dysfunction. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we're getting data about, you know, hydrating the person to avoid uh, uh, consequences of this, but it's something we're going to learn a lot about. And these are very new complications that we never faced in, in uh, AF ablation before. So I think this is going to be uh, important for us, but we're discovering as we go. If you don't look for it, you're not gonna see it, right? Let's move to a different issue. And this is a difficult one. How are you managing the insurance approval and the coding stuff for this innovative technology? And yeah, so there is a role for the national societies to guide us in this path. Yeah, I, I think definitely there's a role for the national societies to uh, to help the situation. I, I think it's also there's a bit of responsibility on the on the companies involved to try and uh, ensure that this kind of safe technology gets out to uh, people who really need to be uh, having this used on them for to, to helping patients. Um, we took an interesting, I mean, it was very, uh, very good of the company here in Australia. So we have a DRG system. So there's an allocation for catheters. Uh, and so given we kind of knew what that allocation was, uh, the company kind of had to make a decision. We're going to charge huge amounts for uh, because it's breaking technology or we're going to come under the cap that has already been set. And so they chose to come under the cap, which it makes it kind of available. Uh, and so therefore it's reimbursed in our system. Um, and, and as a result, we're seeing a great uptake uh, of the system. So I think that, that, that marketing is going to be important. They, they did work with us, a handful of physicians, to kind of come up with the the pricing that could be tolerated to ensure uh, adaptability. And and hopefully the subsequent companies that come in, I mean, Medtronic isn't here yet, but hopefully they'll be here soon, 
um, we will uh, start to see uh, them falling into the same sort of line, but who knows? Uh, it, it's hard to know, uh, prejudge what a company is going to do there. Great, great. And now I have a personal question. We have seen some evidence of how selective the actual doses that were tested for PFA affects predominantly the myocytes, but with lower effects of the, the ganglionic plexuses. Will this help to understand which component is more effective for AF control, like PVI alone with the PFA, or do we need some effect of the innervation? What do you think about it? So I'm going to answer this two parts because um, I, I'm a strong believer in the kind of ganglion effect and its impact on AF ablation outcomes, although our data for it is kind of uh, still evolving. Um, yeah. That's my personal impression. Now, um, this is going to answer that question nicely. You know, is it the extra ablation that's causing the benefit or whether it's uh, it's going to be uh, just the isolation of, uh, of the area. Um, what we're seeing is that there is some ganglion uh, injury. So as we formally test for autonomic dysfunction, we are seeing some changes that occur even with PFA. So I don't think it's going to be immune to no effect. It's just less effect than what we've seen uh, previously. Now, how that translates into outcomes, uh, well, I'm really keen to see as we as we get more uh, experience and more cases uh, on the board. And hopefully this is something that your area can pioneer in terms of the studies involved, given your interest. Huh? So uh, hopefully we'll get more information. Yeah, we have a lot of work to do with that. Yeah. Dr. Sanders, it's a really pleasure chatting with you. Thank you for your time. And it's always nice to have you on Heart of Freedom TV. Thank you for having me. Thanks you and thanks to all for watching.